and Lonnie Gilmore. Mark, Kathy, Church on the Rock is praying for you today. Jerome, Kathy, James and Deborah Garner and family. Candice Romero, Mary L. Rice in South Haven, Mississippi. Bob Slater, Sister Victoria Baines and family in Las Vegas, Nevada. Good morning, Sister Baines. We miss you and we are praying for you. Sister Leola Nash, oh, how we miss you this morning. Your church family is praying for you. You get well soon. God bless you today. Ronald, Karen, and Santanese Jones in McDonough, Georgia. Happy birthday, Mrs. Jones. Your church family loves you. We miss you, and we are praying for you. Happy birthday to you. Janetta Elliott, Roy and Sandra Johnson, Melissa Lawson, Marilyn Mariah Manuel, Velma McGee Carver and family in Milwaukee, Priscilla White, Angela Venable and family, Robin Calhoun, Charles Calhoun, Jasmine Smith, Pastor Larry Ellis of Castro Valley, celebrating his retirement this month, Church on the Rock is praying for you. Pastor Henry L. Davis, Jr., Mrs. Weeda Davis in Detroit, Kirk and Jackie Ford Jackson, Marla Starrett, Walter, Louise, Lynette, and Raquel Crawley, we are praying for you. Helen Jones in Hayward, Hope Richard in East Palo Alto, Sandra McNeil, Stephanie Gaines in San Francisco, Diane Miles in New Orleans, Sadie Tinsley, Carrie Creamer. Sister Creamer, we are still praying for you. Brenda Ireland and family there in Milwaukee, thank you for praying for us and know that we are praying for you. Ariel Crawford, Deacon Wilbur Butler, Catrice Joseph in Warner Robins, Georgia, Jacqueline Thomas Dorset in Los Banos, Rhonda Eller, Sister Jacqueline Marshall, Tom and Donna Arnold, Amia Evans in Houston, Eric Jones in New Orleans, Destiny Jones, Melody McDonald, Mrs. Nadia McDonald and family, Alice Polizzi, we are praying for you today. Yolanda and Robert Herbert Jr. in their hour of bereavement. LaQuint Daphne, we are praying for you. And Terry Gomez, Church on the Rock, is praying for you today. God has smiled on me. He has set me free. Yeah. 
Touch them, God. I pray that you will soften their hearts, God. Let them have an interest in you, God. Let them know that they can trust you, God. Let them know that they can lean and depend on you, God. I just pray that you will just save those that are out there in the world that need you, God. We all need you, God. Not only for those that are unsaved, but those that have fallen by the wayside, those that have backslided, God. Yes, yes. Get their attention, God. You know how to get our attention, God. You know how to open our eyes, God. You know how to show us that we need you, God. So I just pray that you do that for all of us, God. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ, that died on the cross for our sins, God. And we may be able to be in heaven with you, God, one, one day, God. Just thank you, God, for every single thing that you've done in our lives. Just keep us stayed on you, God. Just keep us focused on you, God. There's so many things that's going on in the world, God, and we just need to remember that you are still on the throne, God, that you are still in control of everything, God, and that we just need to keep our faith and trust in you. Yes, yes. Just thank you, God, for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's give the Lord a hand. Praise. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me while I'm on the tedious journey. I want Jesus to walk. Church on the Rock Baptist Live from San Jose, California. Like and share this page. Let somebody know that Pastor Moore and Church on the Rock are on live. Shall we stand together as we get ready to hear a word from the Lord? Oh, by and by, when the morning comes. Whence hath this man 
this wisdom and these mighty works. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Turn around and look at your neighbor. Say, it's not what you know. It's who you know. God bless you today. Do you know the number one complaint among Christians? It's unanswered prayer. We're wired by our instant world to expect quick answers. And when they don't come, we just assume that God did not hear us. Have you listened to your own prayers lately? Our heaven-bound petitions are filled with the gimmies. Give me this and give me that. You know how we are. We only see the need that's right in front of us. A job that pays better wages. A car that won't break down. A spouse who is faithful. A good report from the doctor. A child who obeys his parents. We seldom stop to consider what God is working on down the road for our good. Oprah Winfrey was born into poverty in Mississippi. I'm certain there were times when all she desired was a decent meal. Maybe she prayed for a burger and fries, or a leg, a thigh, and a soft drink. She wouldn't even dare to think much bigger than that. I'm certain that in her poverty, she never dreamed that in her hunger, God was developing in her something far greater than a desire for a Big Mac. He was developing her charitable spirit. Today, because of her experience with hunger, she outdonates most philanthropists. Uh, through adversity, God molded Oprah into his idea of a compassionate, uh, caring person. We have uh, our own ideas uh, of what Christ can and should do for us and with us. But God has a bigger and better plan than we can conceive. And our trials are an important part of his plan for our 
spiritual growth. Uh, are y'all going to stay with me this morning? Uh, like the weightlifter whose muscles are sore after a workout. Uh, our trials are the weights uh, that ultimately uh, strengthen uh, our spiritual muscles. Uh, our trials come uh, to only uh, make uh, us strong. Uh, oh, our prayers reveal uh, our marginal concept uh, of God's power to provide. Uh, we want the answers to our prayers uh, tied up neatly uh, in a box uh, with a ribbon uh, on it. Uh, but God can do a better job. He can mold a poor black girl from Mississippi into a philanthropist or a little black girl from Washington, D.C.'s inner city to become a Supreme Court justice if we let him If we let him, uh, that's the key. Uh, I know you're saying, uh, of course, uh, I would let him. Uh, but there is something uh, that often gets in the way uh, of God's design uh, for our lives. Uh, it's called unbelief. We say that we'll let God do anything he wants with uh, our lives. Uh, but then uh, we uh, want to control his method uh, of delivery uh, because we can't see uh, past uh, what we know. Look at the people of Nazareth. Uh, they have the same problem uh, and it caused many of them to miss out uh, on their blessings. Uh, all these many years uh, they were waiting for their Messiah. Uh, the prophets had warned for centuries that a deliverer, uh, yeah, uh, would one day come to save them. Uh, but they had their own Concept of what a deliverer should look like. And Jesus just didn't fit the bill. Why? Because they were going by what they knew. Well, what did they know? The majority knew Jesus as their neighbor. They were focused on the familiar. Turn around and look at your neighbor and say, they were focused on the familiar. Come on and put your hands together, church. Help me preach this. Yeah, they knew his mother, his father, his brother. Uh, and uh, his sisters. Uh, in their mind, uh, how could Jesus uh, be anything more than ordinary? Uh, to them, uh, Jesus was just uh, the carpenter's son, uh, the one who built their furniture and mended uh, their broken chairs. Uh, they thought, uh, what more could he do? Uh, do for us. They knew the Old Testament promise of a Messiah, but they had their own carnal and finite ideas about what their Savior would look like. After waiting more than 400 years for him to show up, they had formulated their own carnal vision of a savior. They were sure he'd be more like Superman and less like Clark Kent. They knew what they needed, at least they thought they did, and Jesus was not it. 
uh, that's the very reason uh, why so many people today uh, are still uh, unsaved. Uh, they've heard uh, about Jesus, uh, but they can't bring themselves uh, to accept him uh, as anything more than a good man who fell uh, on hard times. Uh, his mother uh, was Mary. Uh, his father uh, was Joseph. Uh, he had brothers uh, and sisters. Uh, case uh, closed. Uh, nothing supernatural uh, here. Uh, they heard uh, Jesus uh, is a friend, uh, but they think uh, who needs another one uh, of those? Uh, they are your modern day uh, Nazarenes. Uh, but what else uh, did these ancient uh, Nazarenes uh, know? Uh, most of them knew uh, the prophetic scriptures uh, and they were insulted uh, by Jesus' claim uh, of superior intellect. Well, uh, instead uh, of being intrigued by Jesus' spiritual knowledge, uh, they rejected uh, his uh, wisdom. Uh, the word says uh, they were astonished, uh, surprised, uh, shocked, uh, bewildered. Uh, instead of tuning in uh, and listening uh, more closely, uh, the majority of them uh, deafened their ears and acted incredulous or skeptical. They just knew in their own finite mind that no carpenter's son could be smarter than them. Picture Jesus standing at the front of the synagogue uh, with no scrolls uh, opened uh, before him uh, because he didn't need uh, to read them. Uh, he uh, wrote uh, the book. Instead, uh, he's unraveling uh, his prophetic knowledge uh, before their stopped up ears. Uh, very few uh, were listening. Uh, instead, uh, their ears uh, were pounding with uh, who does he uh, think uh, he is uh, according to Matthew uh, Jesus's purpose uh, for being there uh, was to fulfill uh, the scripture uh, Matthew wrote uh, and he came uh, and dwelt uh, in a city called Nazareth uh, that it might be fulfilled uh, which was spoken by the prophets. Uh, he shall uh, be called uh, a Nazarene. Uh, don't bother searching uh, for the word Nazarene uh, in the Old Testament uh, because I can tell you uh, that it's not uh, there. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, Matthew uh, was wrong. Uh, allow me to sidetrack a bit uh, and explain. Uh, there are two ways to interpret uh, Matthew's claim uh, of Christ's fulfillment uh, of prophecy. Uh, the first theological theory for Matthew's statement uh, centers on uh, a Hebrew word. Uh, the word Nazarene uh, is very similar uh, to the Hebrew word uh, Netzer, uh, which means uh, branch. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, my Bible readers will attest uh, that the word branch uh, was a common term uh, for the coming uh, Messiah. Isaiah 11 and 1 prophesies uh, that a shoot uh, will come up uh, from the stump uh, of Jesse uh, and 
his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Well, there's also another interesting observation. Since Hebrew was written with only consonants, the word netzer would have appeared as N-Z-R. Uh, the same main consonants uh, as the word uh, Nazareth. Uh, and the Hebrew word for branch uh, sounded very much uh, alike. Uh, Matthew's point uh, could be uh, that Jesus uh, was sprouting up uh, from an obscure village uh, in Galilee. Uh, imagine uh, that, uh, yeah, uh, Jesus uh, was the branch uh, predicted uh, by uh, the prophets uh, and the name uh, of the town uh, he grew up in uh, just happens to sound uh, just like the prophet's word uh, for uh, branch. Well, uh, the second theological theory uh, is that Matthew uh, uses the word uh, Nazarene uh, in reference to uh, a person uh, who is despised and uh, rejected. Uh, in the first century, Nazarene, Nazareth rather, uh, was a small town, uh, about 55 miles north uh, of Jerusalem, uh, and it had uh, a negative uh, reputation uh, among the Jews. Uh, Galilee uh, was generally looked down upon uh, by the Judeans, uh, and Nazareth uh, of Galilee uh, was especially uh, despised. Uh, when the disciple Philip uh, told Nathaniel uh, about Jesus, uh, Nathaniel said, uh, Can any uh, good thing uh, come out uh, of Nazareth? Uh, Matthew may have been consciously thinking uh, of Isaiah 53 and 3, uh, which reads, uh, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. We esteemed him not. Since Nazarenes were scorned by everyone, Matthew may have seen this messianic prophecy as an allusion to Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. Now, back to the synagogue. Jesus is standing before them. Uh, unfolding uh, the mysteries uh, of the prophetic promises uh, of God. Uh, but they uh, don't hear his words. Uh, he lost them uh, as soon uh, as he made the claim uh, that he was the fulfillment uh, of uh, the prophecy. It didn't matter that they knew he was born in Bethlehem. The prophets Micah could have been talking about any of the millions born there. It didn't matter that he was born of a virgin. There were perhaps hundreds of legitimate offspring uh, just in their own town uh, alone. Uh, it didn't matter uh, that he was announced uh, by a messenger named John. Uh, anybody uh, can yell repent uh, and John uh, was just Jesus's uh, crazy uh, cousin uh, who lived out uh, in the wilderness uh, surviving on locust uh, and honey. Uh, who would believe him uh, anyway? Today's uh, unbelievers uh, aren't 
much different. They respond the same way when we tell them Christ is the fulfillment of God's promise to mankind. They hear the words, but they refuse to submit to anyone who claims to be more superior than they are. The only authority they will accept is their own. The only one they trust and will answer to is their own conscience. They snicker when they hear that Jesus said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. Their short-sighted, closed-minded attitude slams shut the only door they really need to walk through. The one that leads to salvation. Well, what else did the Nazarenes know? The majority knew they needed help, but they put a padlock on his powers of potency. Turn around, look at somebody. Say they put a padlock on his powers potency. Give the Lord a hand of praise. We're going home when I tell you that as a result they were barricaded from their own blessings. They were the majority just a small portion of the billions who still do not believe in Christ. These Nazarenes uh, preferred to stick uh, with what they uh, knew. Uh, they weren't ready uh, to veer off uh, into new spiritual territory uh, and relinquish all control uh, to Jesus uh, the Christ. Sure, uh, there were some uh, who believed uh, and were saved. Uh, probably the ones uh, with the most desperate need. Uh, the lame, uh, the blind, uh, the demon possessed. Uh, they were the ones uh, who had everything to gain uh, and nothing uh, to lose. Uh, but the Nazarenes uh, whose lives were on uh, an even keel, uh, they thought, uh, what do we need? Uh, with a perpetrating prophet. Uh, yep, uh, and that's where most unbelievers uh, are today. Uh, they won't need Jesus uh, until they feel helpless uh, and uh, confused. Uh, they won't need Jesus uh, until uh, they are disappointed, uh, disillusioned, uh, in despair, or dying. Uh, they don't see themselves uh, as sinners uh, in need uh, of a Savior. Uh, sadly, uh, they uh, are the real uh, perpetrators. Uh, they pretend uh, to be in control uh, in a crisis. Uh, they pretend uh, to have uh, hope. Uh, they pretend uh, to have uh, strength. Uh, but uh, it's only uh, a performance. Uh, in the end, uh, they uh, lose. Well, uh, what happened uh, to the Nazarenes? Uh, Jesus uh, did not uh, many mighty works there uh, because uh, of uh, their unbelief. Uh, it's no surprise uh, that Nazareth is uh, today uh, the largest Arab city uh, in Israel. Uh, not Christian, uh, not even uh, Jewish, uh, Arab. Uh, that's what happens uh, when you don't uh, believe. Uh, you stifle 
the spread of the gospel. The Nazarenes decided to go with what they knew. They did not realize that the joy of life is found not in what you know, but in who you know. We here today may still be the minority, but as the minority, we have put ourselves in the hands of Jesus. And because we believe, we have full access to his power. We know that there is no circumstance that can restrict him. No adversity that can hinder him. No situation that can constrain him. No enemy that can defeat him. No obstruction that can block him. And no force that can limit him. How many in here are among the saved minority? The same who believe in Christ, trust in Christ, and follow Jesus Christ. Do I have at least a few in here today who sees Jesus for who he really is, who accept and acknowledge his divine wisdom and trust his heavenly power? Do you know heart that he can turn darkness in the light and despair into delight. He can turn nothing into something and nobody into somebody. He can turn bondage into freedom and weakness into strength. He can turn selfishness into compassion and failure into turn yearning into contentment and sorrow into joy. It's not what you know. It's not what you know. It's not what you know. But who you know. Do you know Jesus? The light of the world. Do you know Jesus? My big brother. Do you know Jesus for yourself? you know. Not where you've been to school. Not what's in your bank account. Not what family you come from. Not who your mother was or who your father was. It's not what you know. about my hairdo. Mm. And I've learned to just ignore mm -hmm. the foolish. Yeah. But this morning, some knucklehead said a comment 
When are you going to be over trying to spread this myth, this fairy tale that church and Jesus will do you good? That somebody who has been disappointed, that somebody who has been hurt, that somebody who prayed and didn't get their prayers answered the way they thought they should be answered. I understand that we are living in a time where people hate God. I know they hate God because they hate his church. You can't love God and hate the church because the church is the body of Christ. And God is only coming back for one thing, not your sorority, not your fraternity, not your secret society, not your man-made club. He's coming back for the church. And the church is not a building of brick and mortar. But the church is the body of believers on the inside who are holding up the blood-stained banner. Pastor Moore, why do you preach so hard? Pastor Moore, why do you preach so long? 30, 40 years. Pastor Moore, why do you do it? In a world where they hate God, they don't want to believe in Jesus. Every other religion can come over to this country from every other country, wear the rags on their heads and speak in a foreign language and talk about a God that is dead or doesn't exist. Even in our own city council, they encourage you from saying in the name of Jesus. And yet, you press forward through the criticisms. You press forward through the ridicule. You press forward through the jokes. Why do you do it? There's only one reason, mm -hmm. Sister Clara. There's only one reason, Sister Gardner, right. that I press on. Yes. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. The blood came streaming down. Take up his cross 
and follow me. That's the prerequisite for discipleship. You may be feeling guilty because you've been living in sin. Christ is not the head of your life. You've relegated Christ to certain rooms in your life. He's not welcome in the bathroom or the bedroom. He's welcome in the family room and the living room, but not in the kitchen. You've relegated Christ to certain areas of your life. He wants to be a part of every area of your life. He wants to be in total control, but you have to let him in. You say, preacher, how do I do that? It starts with humble submission. It starts with prayer. Telling God you're sorry for living without him. Telling him you're sorry for the sins you committed and that you're ready now for him to put his yoke around your neck and lead you and guide you every day all the way. If that is your choice today, why don't you give us a call at area code 408-532-ROCK or go to our website at churchontherockbaptist.com Hit the message button. Let us know of your decision for Jesus. We'll pray for you and with you and help you find a strong Bible-believing Christian church. Well, it's offering time here at Church on the Rock. And what an opportunity now it is to be able to share our gifts with the Lord. We realize that God is the one who put food on our tables, clothes on our backs, shoes on our feet, transportation. God is the one that gives us the strength to be able to go out and work a job. The government doesn't ask you to give, they just take 30% of whatever you earn. But God says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Some of you have been robbing God a long time, isn't it time to get your debts in order? Start with God. If you've been blessed by this ministry, this word, this church, why not sow into us so that we can continue doing what we've been doing for almost 33 years right here in Silicon Valley? We've made it so easy for you to be able to give today through the various financial apps on your telephone. Zelle Pay is the preferred app, but we also use PayPal and Cash App. All you have to do when you log into those apps is enter our telephone number, area code 408-532-7625. Or go to the GiveLify app, search for Church on the Rock Baptist, you'll see a picture of the sanctuary. And we're also on our website, churchontherockbaptist.com. Hit the giving button, follow the instructions there. If you're on Facebook Live, at the top of the screen, there is an app button. You can hit it. It'll take you straight to PayPal. Finally, you may mail your gift to Church on the Rock. Post Office Box 730-341, San Jose, California, 95173. And when you do it, I want you to expect a blessing. I want you to expect something good to happen in your life. And I want you to believe that God will never let you outgive him. So thank you in advance. And God bless you for what you are about to do. Well, until next time, same place, same time, join us that you may get a breakthrough and know that we're here praying for you and asking you to help us by praying for us as well. Don't you give up. Don't you give in. We're in this battle, this war going on, and we want to encourage you to stay on the battlefield. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Say!